Welcome to another video from the Average Jake Firefighter blog. Today's video is going to be about padlocks. Something we've seen even in the suburban fire environment is that padlocks are being used more prevalently. People are securing vacant homes, uh, vacant mobile homes, sheds, anything they can think of if they can use a cheap or uh, even an expensive padlock on these, on these occupancies or buildings they're going to do so to try and save some money. So we've been encountering these more and more uh, lately. So this video is going to be kind of two parts. One, it's going to detail some of the things we've recently found in our padlock uh, training, specifically construction of the lock and how difficult it is to force some of these higher-end padlocks. And then we're going to talk about the prop that we've built in order to uh, continue our training, in order to maximize our training with multiple locks and utilize in uh, a single door. First, let's talk about the prop. The prop itself is just a donated door from a commercial business in our district. What we did with the prop was take some, uh, went to a hardware store and we got these two plates that you can see. And then we had some, uh, some just some random hardware that we tried a couple different attempts. And we came up with the configuration that you see on your screen. It allows us to mount multiple locks, multiple different styles of locks to the, to the prop. And also those bolts on the back side allow us to loosen and tighten based on what kind of hasp or locking hasp we're trying to simulate. It can allow it to slide out a little further or be a little bit tighter depending, again, on what kind of hasp we're trying to simulate. It also it adjusts to fit multiple kinds of locks. As you're going to see in some of the forcible entry portions of the video, that lo the different locks kind of lock to the hasp a little bit different. When you have a, uh, like a circular lock like when you, you see on the, pipe, uh, the prop, it's a little bit different and a little bit, it needs a little bit more space on a locking hasp versus one that kind of has that long U-shaped hasp and hangs down a little bit lower. So this prop gives us a ton of flexibility on what we can mount to it and the hardware on it is pretty daggone solid as you can see and it'll stand up to multiple, multiple forces. Plus, this allows us to save money on having to keep buying cheap hasps, which usually fail under, uh, under a lot of forcible entry pressure when you're striking the lock, and it allows us to continually use this prop over and over and over again. Uh, the door itself is just, a, like I said, a donated door, a solid wood core door that came from a commercial occupancy that was donated to us. So even all in all, too, it's a pretty cheap prop that you can put together and uh, use over and over and over again. Now let's talk about some of the forcible entry stuff. Here you're going to see some videos of us just using the prop. Uh, we initially mounted just some regular hasps to the door and we're forcing them with some pretty cheap locks just to get our technique down. Uh, we used, we cut, we hit, we did a whole lot of stuff, but then we wanted to kind of step our challenge up, so we went and got some better and better locks. Because the cheap locks are really good for getting the technique down, but not great for uh, for the challenge. They're not very challenging. So we just we decided to step our game up a little bit. So as I said, we went and got a couple different, uh, more challenging locks from Master Lock. We went to just our local hardware store. I believe these came from a Home Depot. Uh, we got three pretty challenging locks. We got two Master Lock grades, uh, grade sevens. One was the circular lock you see, and the other one is that long hanging, uh, long hanging like U shape lock that you see, just a standard normal padlock. And then the other one we got was a grade nine. Um, master lock and uh, you can see that these locks are pretty well they're pretty sturdy um, surprisingly and we didn't take a video of it and I wish we had but we have some pictures of it the <clears throat> the uh, seven grade uh, kind of snap lock little circular lock was relatively easy to force the regular style padlock seven grade took about 25 hits that I'm going to show you in a video here in a minute it was still able to be done with the irons, but it was significantly difficult. It, uh, it was, you know, very challenging. Uh, I remember some of us commenting the next day that while we were trying to force it, our hands hurt from hitting the lock so much. The grade 9 lock was completely impossible to force with the irons, at least as far as we did. We hit it, 
<clears throat> multiple ways, multiple times, multiple people, multiple sledgehammers, multiple different halligans, and we were just unable to get that lock forced. Uh, we're going to show later in the video just some of the construction stuff about the lock uh, that's going to really open your eyes on why these locks are so difficult to force. Here's the video of us forcing that number seven regular padlock. As you can see, it's pretty difficult. That's after about 25 hits uh, with a sledgehammer. It's an eight pound sledge and a regular Halligan bar. Here's the aftermath of that number seven master lock padlock. As you can see, it didn't really defeat the locking mechanism. It just snapped off the, uh, the padlock portion. Uh, also, you can see the aftermath of some of the other locks, that specifically that grade 7 circular lock, which was defeated a lot easier than uh, I would expected. It only took about four or five hits, and it popped right off, So, which, uh, you know, which made us think that the construction of these things are really what makes them strong. It's not necessarily what they're made out of. I mean, that has a factor to it, but uh, how they're secured in the locking mechanism is a is really a big factor. Uh, as you, you're going to be able to see here in the next couple pictures that we show, the uh, number seven lock and the number nine regular padlocks are deep inside the locking mechanism, whereas the circular grade circular uh, lock that was still a grade seven, the way it's secured is completely uh, just exposes that lock to easy forcible entry. Now we're going to just talk about some of the construction of the lock. You can see the difference in the number 7 and the number uh, 9 locking hasps. You can also see we decided to cut these locks open and just look at what is inside. And you can see that these locks, even the number 7 and number 9, they are deep inside the locking mechanism. And in order to overcome all of that inside of there, you've got to exert a tremendous amount of force on the locking mechanism. And the bigger that lock and shackle, the harder it's going to be to pull it out of the, uh, the pull it out of that locking mechanism. Whereas you can conversely, you can see even though it's a grade seven, that circular lock, it's not really deep inside the lock. It doesn't have a whole lot to grab onto and it just splits right open when you force it. So the construction of these locks, and it's something that not a lot of people delve into, the construction of these locks uh, in any forcible entry video I've seen, they just talk about how to force them and what's the best ways to force them. They never show you the guts of that lock, and I thought that was important to know that this is what you're really trying to overcome. You're trying to overcome that locking mechanism itself, and based on how that lock is built, a cheap lock that's not deep inside the, ha uh, the uh, locking mechanism is going to be way easier to force than some of these higher grade locks. No matter whether they're, even if it's a case hardened steel or a boron style lock, uh, it's going to be based on how that lock is secured in that actual locking mechanism. You can have the greatest uh, locking shackle all you want, but if it's at the very top of the locking mechanism and it's not deep inside that actual padlock, it's going to be relatively easy to force. We forced 50 or 60 cased hardened uh, locks that were at the very top that weren't locked deep into that uh, locking mechanism. So construction matters when you're when you're doing these things. So take a look at the lock. Take 30 seconds to try and assess what type of lock you're dealing with, and it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Maybe you got to go to the saw. Maybe you've got to attack the uh, the locking hasp because that's usually the weak right, point so anyway cool. when you're dealing with these things. Biggest thing to remember with any of these things is that we've got to keep training on them. Uh, maybe these are things that you're only going to see once or twice in your lifetime depending on where you work. But that's even more reason to get out there and train on them because when you do see them, you don't want to look like you have no idea what you're doing. Big shout out to the guys I work with, guys and girls I work with. Uh, a lot of this stuff was just my idea, but it was their ingenuity on how to build it, how to make it work appropriately. Wouldn't be able to have such successful training if it wasn't for them. Uh, last thing, just like I always say, it's our responsibility to invest in ourselves, invest in our team. You cannot control the amount of fires you're going to. You cannot control the amount of experience you get, but you can totally control how trained you are how well educated you are, 
and how in shape you are. And those are the things that are going to matter when you do get that fire or you do get that bad EMS call or extrication. So spend an hour every day in the library reading, read a training article, read fire engineering, read firehouse, read uh, a blog if you like, you know, something that's going to educate you. Then get out there on the drill floor for at least an hour doing something with your hands, doing hands-on training, forcible entry, stretching hose lines, anything. Look around your district for things that you can get donated to you. Uh, we have a car dealership in our district that, gave, that gives us uh, wrecked car doors that we utilize for extrication training just for some tool time. Again, these doors that we used were donated to us. So get out there, make some friends with the people in your district, and maybe you'll get some, some good training stuff. And lastly, spend an hour every day in the gym getting in shape. This job is a physically demanding job. The firefighter job, the, in, the rubber meets the road job, is still blue collar, hands on. We've got to be in shape. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You can spend that hour in the, gym, uh, in the library, and you can spend that hour on the drill floor, but if you don't have the gas tank to get to the fifth floor to utilize all that knowledge, then it's a waste of time. And I'd just like to end it with, thanks for watching the video. Hope you got something out of it. As usual, you can uh, always follow me on Twitter at AverageJakeFF. Check out the blog, Average Jake Firefighter blog, uh, www.averagejakefirefighter.com. Check us out on the First Arriving Network. Check out the Firehouse Kitchen Table on Facebook and on Twitter. And stay safe out there. Keep training. Invest in yourself. Invest in your team every day. Thanks for watching.